For more than a decade, I have been obsessed with this idea of exaptation. Exaptation is a concept from evolutionary biology, and it's when something that originally evolved because of one set of survival advantages gets serendipitously co-opted for something completely different and thrives there. The quintessential example is birds' feathers. Feathers originally evolved because they kept animals warm. They trapped a lot of air, and air is a good insulator. If you're an animal with a lot of feathers trapping a lot of air and a predator chases you off a cliff, instead of plummeting down and dying, you might flutter down and survive. And that means you get to reproduce, and you give time for those feathers, many generations, to evolve into something completely different, like flight. So flight is a serendipitous exaptation of warmth. Think about that the next time you zip up your down jacket. Now, why am I so obsessed with this? I'm not a biologist, I'm a software architect, and I'm not particularly interested in flight. What I am interested in is how people have good ideas, and I think that exaptation holds the key. I think that exaptation is not just a biological phenomenon, but it's a cognitive one. And that most of those big aha moments of innovation are moments when somebody realizes, often serendipitously, that something they thought only applied in one context can actually be applied somewhere else. Harvard University created the astronomical medicine team after the serendipitous discovery that the 3D imaging techniques that doctors use to explore a brain, if applied at a vastly different scale, can help astronomers explore a supernova. This is just one example of mental exaptations, and history is replete with these sorts of anecdotes, anecdotes and I like to tell them, but what I don't like is how prominently serendipity plays a role in these equations. That's why, for the last six years, my team's been working on developing the right set of tools, the right conditions, the right environment in which mental acceptations can flourish. We believe that by understanding how good ideas happen, we can create virtual software environments that help people have more of them. Over the next few minutes, we'll listen to what it sounds like when new ideas are born, and not born just from serendipity, but from intentional facilitation from a set of interactions that I believe can be optimized, can scale, and when scaled, can dramatically change the way innovation happens today. A couple weeks ago, I set up a meeting between these two people. Dr. Christoph Diaz, PhD scientist who lives in Boston and is a program manager at Cohen Veterans Biosciences that's doing research on post-traumatic stress disorder. And somebody some of you may recognize, he's here in the audience today, uh, Dr. David Vishnoff, Associate Professor of Religious Studies right here at OU, specializing in, in Islamic hermeneutics. These people had never met before, and I didn't set up this uh, meeting because they particularly wanted to meet. In fact, you can listen to Christoph uh, just before the meeting. Any idea what you and David Vishnoff have in common? Besides yeah, we both uh, went to Fez. Do I have the right one, like professor in like, Islam studies? <laughs> Christoph has no idea why I've set up this meeting, and I, I can assure you that it's not because they had both been to Fez. What they had in common is that over the last year, they had both participated in an experimental new platform my team's been developing called the Cognitive Network. It's like a social network because it connects people together, but it's not about being social. It's about facilitating thought. And the first step in a Cognitive Network is to get the ideas in people's heads into a tangible format so that they can become first-class citizen nodes in the network with everything else. Now, there's many different ways that ideas can take tangible form, but I work in software, so what my team has developed is a set of tools that makes it easy to translate ideas into software apps. And because we're interested in exaptation, we call these apps Zaps. When David first joined the Cognitive Network, the idea he was interested in pursuing was how to explore the conceptual landscape of every book ever written on his particular topic of interest and how to curate those concepts in the act of writing his own book. So we worked together to build this app that used a bunch of different data science techniques and linked visualizations to help him explore tens of thousands of books returned by queries to the OU library databases. When Christoph joined the Cognitive Network, 
He was interested in many different things, but one of the things he was interested in was how to help his researchers explore all of the medical literature that had been written about PTSD. When the two of them realized that they had these very similar zaps in common, they didn't waste any time talking about Fez. David dug right into some specific details. How do those numerical settings on the left hand, those mysterious numerical settings on the left hand side, how, how do you have to find your tweak in those? I haven't used the tool as much as, as you have. Uh, so, so this is where um, we, we focused more on the solid tool that I think David has also on one of his tab to, to take it a step further. So what's happening here is David's asked about a very specific feature set in the tool. And Christoph is not familiar with those settings because actually his tool doesn't have those settings. These apps are similar, but they're not exactly the same. And so he sidesteps the question by changing the topic to another zap that he is more familiar with. But because zaps are so accessible and tangible, he can immediately give David a demo. Looking at the four or five concepts that we've picked, and it compares them to all the concepts that exist in the model, in this case around 1600. And he's looking at what path exists, if any, between uh, the concept that you chose and all of them that are in the model. Just to give an example, if you pick up this one, you see how do you go from dopamine to this other concept? You can go between those two concepts via different paths. And this represents biological experiment and results that people have produced in literature. Now there's something subtle that's happening here, so I need to point it out, but it's important because it gets right to the heart of one of the biggest challenges of cross-disciplinary collaboration, and that's domain-specific languages. When two experts from different domains come together, they're rarely using the same language, even if it sounds like they're using the same words. I've watched Christoph give this demo many, many times, and I've never heard him use the word concept. He always uses the word entity. But when he gives the demo to David, he uses the word concept five times in 30 seconds. And that's because he knows what he and David have in common, which are zaps around concept mapping. And so he intuitively finds a set of terminology that he thinks has the best chance of resonating with David. And David, in response, is able to use Christoph Zapp as a prop for his own communication to be in terms that he thinks will resonate most with Christoph. The huge leap here is that with the other Zapp, co-occurrence is the only sort of medical concept you have. You had to try to look at the content of the audience and determine, oh, when dopamine and something else appear in this article, there's a specific kind of relationship mm -hmm. in the real world or in the scientific evidence. You had to define an ontology. How does the world work? Mm -hmm. And you've had to map these, this bare data about co-occurrence. You had to turn that into when dopamine occurs with whatever here, that's actually articulating the idea we have an increase in dopamine occurs and increase in mm -hmm. whatever. And that's what I'm interested in. When a religious studies professor starts a sentence talking about dopamine and then ends it with, that's what I'm interested in, that, that's when I get uh, really excited. And just like uh, Christoph had moved the conversation in a different direction by bringing in uh, a secondary zap, David then moves the conversation in a different direction now that they know how to communicate by bringing in some of his latest work. I've got about 30 different manuscripts of the Psalms of David not the ones you know from the Bible, but ones Muslims wrote when they just rewrote it. There's some overlap between those texts, but they did a lot of editing and they did a lot of rewriting and then they added more of this and then they dropped stuff here. So you have these 30 manuscripts or so that have sort of the same text and I'm trying to figure out which was the earlier text, what did each editor do? Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I think it's best to think of this discussion like a network. And in fact, I think it's best to think of all ideas like networks. Ideas are not monolithic things. They're networks of modular things. And if we look at the discussion so far, this is how we started with Christoph and David connecting around the commonality of two zaps. Then Christoph brought in another zap that had a little bit less in common with the others. And David brought in a project that also had less in common. And this introduces a concept that I like to call exaptation distance, which is I think there's an optimal distance between ideas to promote exaptation. Ideas that are too close, I think it's easy to get lost in specific details, as almost happened in the beginning of this conversation. And ideas that are too far apart, they're just hard to bridge. 
But we know we're getting close to the optimal acceptation distance when David starts to make direct comparisons between his more distant work and Christoph's more distant work. Just to point out why Christoph's tool here was looking really familiar. So with these psalms, you can just map out the relationship between which texts are connected to which texts. Or you can look at from one text to another, which chunks of text got moved around from the text on the left to the text on the right and what got mm -hmm. reproduced. Now, I wish I had a functional MRI and EEG on Christoph and David as they were having this conversation, because there's actually been a lot of research, most notably being done by, by Dr. Mark Beeman, about the areas of the brain that are active during problem solving versus during moments of insight. Normal problem solving tends to rely on the prefrontal cortex, and you can see that very clearly through EEG and MRI. But moments of insight, Beeman's found, rely on a different part of the brain called the ASTG, the anterior superior temporal gyrus. And Beeman was able to detect, predict, moments before somebody solved an insight problem that they were about to just by looking at activation in the ASTG. Now, we didn't have the benefit of MRI. We can't rely on that. So we have to wait for the indication through excited interruption. You can take a whole bunch of text and say which ones include Can, which can ones. you just, sorry, I have to interrupt you. Dave, can you just image Google Synteny map? So it looks like genome reallocation between different species. And then if the gene is in this part of the chromosome in human, where is it in mouse? So exactly the same. The same. I think you can, can hear the tenor of the conversation start to change as these acceptations start to happen, this first one. And acceptations are contagious. I had a couple other members of my team listening in on this conversation, and we were all trying very hard um, not to interrupt the conversation between David and Christoph. But I think all of our ASTGs were firing, and Andrea had an idea that was definitely worthy of interruption also. To bring in another random example, Dave, do you know the Ben Fry project where he took check-ins from GitHub code? If you search deep process, it's a technique that he developed to show like how code was edited. So like how co pieces of code got moved around in a code base. It's kind of critical to use the text itself as the ground for the, for the visualization. There's something particularly interesting, I think, about Andrea's acceptation. And it's that this project, Deprocess by Ben Fry, is not actually about visualizing the edits of code through GitHub. This visualization is showing the looping structure of code. But I think it would be a mistake to attribute this to just uh, misremembering or the fallibility of memory. I think that would be to, to presuppose that the most important job of memory is perfect recall, which I think perhaps it is not. Just like one of the most important jobs of cell replication is to make mistakes, because without mutation, there can be no evolution of life. I think in discussions like this, one of the important jobs of our minds is to make mistakes so that there can be these mutations that live, that lead to the evolution of new ideas. I actually don't think that Andrea is misremembering the process. I think she's just already synthesizing a number of different projects that she does know about, of which there are many visualizations about edits in GitHub, into this idea of this acceptation, which has actually led to perhaps the most tangible step forward for David displaying his own work. He says at the end, oh, it never occurred to me that I could use the text itself as the ground for the visualization. So look at what these acceptations are doing to our idea network. Christoph's bringing in this idea from genetics, Andrea is bringing in the work of another designer that she's familiar with. One thing that's important about this is that everything's grounded in very tangible artifacts. And that's important because conversations like this can easily spiral up and up into pie in the sky ideas so vague as to not be actionable. But in our idea network, things are actually moving in the other direction. They're becoming more and more tangible. And with a little bit more discussion, David comes up with a very concrete idea for a new zap. If Christoph's zap, if I could get a blank copy of that with, let's say, a set of Arabic texts as its data set, all I need is two things. One is the, where do I enter a little piece of information when I've read a text? And then the place where I can customize the nature of the relationships, define relationships, right? Those are the only two things I need to be able to do and use that. But could even be 
just my way of keeping notes yeah. that finally will result in my book. Yeah. Right. But if I if I'm doing a lot of work over a ten year project to write a book, I'm going to have notes in one format or another. It better not just be this time around three by five cards or a long word document. Right? Sure. Sure. If I can take my notes in this kind of environment, where I will then be able to use those notes in new ways, uh, that's that's really intriguing. So what started as a somewhat awkward introduction between two strangers has now led to a very concrete idea for a new sort of note-taking research tool. And that idea actually has 90% of its groundwork already laid in work that's been done in other Zeps. Now, I'm not sharing this discussion with you because I think it's the only time discussions has led to new ideas. People have exciting discussions that lead to new ideas all the time, all over the place, in all sorts of environments. But what I do think is new is the idea of using the lens of exaptation to look at ideas as networks so that we can actively facilitate innovation and we can facilitate it in a way that can scale. If there's one thing that technology is extremely good at doing today, it's building large-scale networks in very short periods of time. Over the next year, Christoph and I are working with Cohen Veterans Biosciences to build a cognitive network that will help the mental exaptations of all of the researchers working on the hard problem of post-traumatic stress disorder. David's going to continue building zaps for his own research, and my team's working hard to create a widespread open version of the cognitive network that anyone can join. These exaptations are just the beginning. Thank you very much.